Hello everyone, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dhiman Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature, Center for Comparative Literature, Bhasha Bhavan, Vishubharati. The author of this module is Dr. Shagota Bhattacharya. The course is Canadian Literature and this particular module deals with Confederation Poetry. The learning objectives of this particular modules are what is confederation, who were the confederation poets, what were the major thematics of confederation poetry, how are these confederation poets interlinked, what were the effects of Canadian poetry with reference to confederation poetry on the later generation of poets. Confederation Poetry Canadian poetry composed between 1867 and 1918 is generally regarded as confederation poetry. A group of poets began writing poems following the formation of the new dominion of Canada on July 1st, 1867. They called themselves confederation poets. Among them, the most prominent were Charles G.D. Roberts, Archibald Lampman, Bliss Carmen, and Duncan Campbell Scott. The first volume of verse in the newly confederated Canada was published by Charles Mayer in 1868 called Dreamland and Other Poems. Isabella Valency Crawford was another prominent figure of the period. Her books Malcolm's Katie and Other Poems 1884 and Old Spooks's Pass 1894 spoke of a frustrated life at Peterborough and Toronto. In the second half that is from 1900s to 1918, Pauline Johnson and Robert Service dominated the scene. These poets failed to match the work of their immediate predecessors and the achievement of the Confederation poets remained unchallenged till the emergence of E.J. Pratt and the First World War. Confederation poetry in Canada is situated at a particular historical juncture in Canada. With the Confederation of 1867, a group of poets considered themselves to be a product of this historical event. With much development in the field of poetry post-confederation, Canadian confederation poetry received a major contributor known as E.J. Pratt. Charles G. D. Roberts, 1860-1943. Charles George Douglas Roberts, hailed as the father of Canadian poetry, was born in 1860 in New Brunswick. He was the first among Canadian poets to obtain worldwide reputation. He started his career as a school principal and later became the editor of Shatton Star. His first book of poems, Orion and Other Poems, 1880, created quite a stir. In Diverse Stones and Songs of the Common Day are among his other books. Roberts was famous for using the animal story, that is, a native Canadian art form, in his poems. He was a huge influence among his contemporaries as well as his successors. Ballad to a Kingfisher Ballad to a Kingfisher is a combination of nature and mythology. The poem is addressed to a kingfisher, a bird who symbolizes eternal love. The poet asks the kingfisher from where it has come and how it intends to suit itself in the windy cliffs and rocks of the Canadian landscape. The poem is addressed to such a bird who should thrive in softer climates than Canada and the poet does not conceal his surprise in finding a kingfisher thriving on manures. The poem is based on the Greek myth of the love story between, say, the king of Thessae, 
He argues the kingfisher not to be content and never to resign even in the face of terrible anguish. It has been born to brave storms and thrive in a difficult world. Though on the face of it the poem is addressed to a particular bird and refers quite specifically to a particular myth, the poem is very much related to the nature and landscape of Canada. It alludes to the difficulties of thriving in the Canadian nature. To winter. To winter is an ode to the winter season in the fashion of Keats's Ode to Autumn. In this long poem, the poet addresses the season which rules with an iron hand. Winter in Canada is a particularly harsh season, a time of the year when everything is barren and rugged. The poet describes his awe at the ruthlessness of winter, which rudely overrides everything delicate. In spite of its ruggedness, winter too has its own magic melodies. The sobbing of the brooks and the waterfalls, the gargling sounds of the streams flashing through the meadows, and the cackling of wild geese add to its charm. The poet lists a number of sights and sounds which still the countryside throughout the year except in winter. The music of the leaves, the sunlight, the raptures, cooning of the birds, the bright shining stars, none are to be found in this dark, silent season. The only audible sound is that of the snowbirds twitter under the bitter breath of the snow. The nature becomes an important character in understanding the trials and tribulations of the poet's mind. It evokes what is happening within and without. The birds, the winter, all evoke the adaptability of the human agency who is trying to cope with the new homeland and how that is being reflected in the artistic productions. William Bliss Carman, 1861 to 1929. William Bliss Carman was born in Fredericton in the maritime province of New Brunswick. Bliss spent most of his life in the United States of America, where he worked as an editor of New York Independent. As a student of Harvard University, Bliss was influenced by spiritual idealism and transcendentalism of Ralph Emerson. His first book, Low Tide on Grand Pre, 1893, brought him instant success. Among his other notable works are Songs of Vagabondia, 1894, Behind the Arras, A Book of the Unseen, A Vagabond Song. A Vagabond Song is yet another eulogy of the autumn season. Just like Charles G. D. Roberts, Bliss Carman too follows the same tradition of British Romanticism and undoubtedly has a Keatsian influence. The opening line of his poem, There is something in the autumn that is native to my blood, attributes to this fact. It is a short 14-line poem which praises autumn as the season of mood, rhyme and colors such as crimson, purple and yellow. It sets the mood for joy and festivity. The scarlet color of the maple leaves fills the poet's heart with music and joy. The frosty asters upon the hills make him long to go for a walk. It is the spirit of the season that urges the poet to get up and follow her from one hill to another. It is the season of autumn which ignites the passion of vagabondia within the poet. He feels that Autumn calls each vagabond by name. Low Tide on Grand Pre Low Tide on Grand Pre is a picturesque description of the beautiful landscape of a Canadian meadow. It refers to a pre in Acadia, also known as Acadia, the original French base in Canada. The poem begins with the description of the sunset in Pre, which bears testimony to the history of French in Canada. A grievous stream flows through the fields of Acadie as the history of French colonization in Canada has gone through many low tides. The poet laments that it was not very long ago when they had the right over this land and ruled it. At present, the river beneath 
their feet has become drowsy and there is a gloom everywhere in the air. Loss and death have taught them to become wise but not to give up dreaming. The poet asks whether at the end of the day desires and regrets, fears and memories and tomorrow and yesterday all become one. The poem ends on a note of grief as the tide now and again comes drifting across the barren land. The harsh wind and the cold foam of the feeling sea seem like a sigh to the poet. He feels that grief, like flood, is waiting to burst into homes. Archibald Lampman, 1861 to 1899. Archibald Lampman is described as the Canadian Keats. Lampman was born in Ontario and along with Wilfred Campbell and Duncan Campbell's court wrote a literary column at the Mermaid Inn for Toronto Globe, February 1892 to July 1893. Lampman was a huge fan of G.D. Roberts, the most popular and widely anthologized among the Confederation poets. He wrote over 300 poems on nature and love. His famous works are among the Millet and Other Poems, 1888, Lyrics of Earth, 1895, Alcyon, 1899, Snow. Lampman's Snow is similar in theme and treatment to Charles Roberts's To Winter. Lampman was influenced by Roberts to a great extent, and most of his nature poems are examples of the fact that he tried to imitate Roberts's themes through his own poems are far more lyrical. In Snow, Lampman describes a picturesque scene of a winter day where the far-off plains and the facing forests are shrouded under a cloak of snow. There is absolute calm and quiet. As the evening deepens, the numbness increases and the poet starts falling asleep. In his dream, he hears the sound of streams gurgling and bursting. Content with some sound, the poet keeps on dreaming happily. The Canadian singer-songwriter Lorena McKinnett adapted the poem and the song in her album to drive the cold winter away, 1987. A Summer Evening a summer evening describes a quiet evening in summer which does not appear to differ very much from a winter evening. There are clouds, blue misted hills, mysterious bales and the picture of a perfect peaceful world. There is stillness and silence but also the shining sun and the starry sky. There is a cricket chattering away and the nostalgia of old times. The summer evening seems to be a familiar, almost like an eternal part of nature. In the long summer evenings, there is joy and contentment, but not excitement. As the sun sets and night falls, the joy gives way to a feeling of coldness and numbness. The darkness makes the poet feel that sleep or death is slowly approaching. Thus, the contentment gives way to a hint of sadness as the summer evening transforms into a summer night. We have seen so far that nature has played a major role in the Confederation poets. Now one has to understand that with this group of poets who declared themselves as the product of the Confederation, we are also actually dealing with their sense of belongingness to this particular land called Canada. As settlers, they were continuously aligning their existence with the original inhabitants of the land. Developing an idea about what Canada is all about then became an imperative to realign their understanding of the land in the words through which they expressed the characteristics of this land. Winter or the new bird or the new plant which they encountered in the new homeland. Duncan Campbell Scott 1852 to 1947. Scott was a bureaucrat, poet and writer. Born in Ottawa, he worked as a civil servant from 1913 to 1932 and was known for advocating the assimilation of Canada's First Nations into mainstream society. 
His first book, The Magic House and Other Poems, was published in 1893. Labor and the Angel, 1898. New World Lyrics and Ballads, 1905, are among his other books. Scott was interested in nonfiction as well. When Spring Goes By When Spring Goes By talks of the poet's ecstasy as winter takes leave and the season of spring approaches. Nature changes her attire. Winds start blowing softly and the first robin pops up and tries to announce the herald of spring. While still ice lingers on the rocks, the poet knows that spring is not far behind. The soft buds peep in the woods, the frail fruits start growing and the banishing lakes intend to return. The new moon and the clear sky bring back the rapture in the poet's heart. The glad robin wakes everyone up by crying joyfully, Spring! Spring! Along with the robin, the poet too dances with joy. At the Cedars At the Cedars, perhaps the best known poem by Scott is a deliberate experimentation where the theme is very much like his short stories. It is a love story between Baptiste and Isaac Dufour. Isaac was a foreman who walked in the lumber fields and was in love with Baptiste. It was difficult to persuade the girl and one day when she was picking berries on the other side of the river Cedars, Isaac went to cross the river and fell down. The logs which he had cut caught him and crushed him. When Baptiste saw the blood, she did not scream but steadily launched her canoe into the river. It hit a log and cracked like a shell. The poet who stood as an observer on the shore saw both of them sing together. It is a tragedy that haunted him forever. We have seen that Scott, what was one of the major influential figures as far as confederation poetry is concerned. He was probably one of those people, those settlers who wanted to realign the understanding of the land with the original inhabitants, that is the native people. He was also a promoter of assimilation of the native people within the broader Canadian society. It is very interesting to note that nature again reoccurs as a major theme in this poem because nature as seen outside and nature as experienced within. In the across Canadian Confederation poetry, nature has been a major influence. E. J. Pratt, 1882 to 1964. After the Confederation poets, the most prominent figure in the next phase of post-Confederation poetry in Canada was E. J. Pratt. Edwin John Duff Pratt was born in Newfoundland studied at the University of Toronto and taught English literature at Victoria College. His first poem, Racial, A Sea Story of Newfoundland, was published in 1917. His first memorable collection was Newfoundland, verse published in 1923. His other notable works include The Witcher's Brew, 1925, and Brebeuf, and his brethren, 1940. Pratt is famous for describing this struggle to make a living on land in his poems about maritime life and the history of Canada. His long narrative poems depict the dark side of nature and the struggle for survival. For example, the Titanic Brebeuf and his brethren towards a last spy, etc. RMS Titanic. The Titanic was a British passenger liner ship that sank on April 14 or 15, 1912 in the North Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic was written by Pratt in 1935 about the sinking of the ship, the Titanic, on April 14, 15, 1912 in the North Atlantic Ocean. About 50 of the liner's passengers were either Canadian residents or were migrating to Canada. The initial wireless messages sent from the sinking ship were picked up in Montreal and then relayed to the rest of the world. 
Several of the dead bodies found were brought to Halifax, Nova Scotia and buried in local cemeteries. Hence, Pratt considers this mammoth historical tragedy to be a Canadian one. His poem chronicles the journey of the ship from her launch on May 31, 1911 to her destruction on April 15, 1912. The poem is a long descriptive one which minutely touches upon all the details that have now become almost legendary. The second half of the poem describes in great detail the incidents which took place one after the other. As the ship hit the iceberg, the change in the attitude of its crew and later its passengers have been delineated carefully. The last part is purely a part of lamentation and grief at the tremendous loss which the world has suffered. It was not a paltry tragedy, however, in a sense, it was a deeply connected Canadian tragedy. Come Not the Seasons Here Come Not the Seasons Here is Pratt's lamentation on the dominance and overwhelming presence of the winter season in Canada. He reused that here, that is in Canada, spring does not come. The joyful sounds of spring, a child's cry or a cuckoo's call are not to be found in Canada. After spring, the second stanza of the poem laments the absence of summer. The red poppy in the morning light or the wild rose are not the sights of Canada. Similarly, autumn also does not visit this land. It is from the brown pastures and the dry wells that farmers realize that autumn has arrived. But the pleasures of autumn cannot be felt by them. It is only the coldness of a glacial storm that can be felt in Canada. It is a harsh, cold land where the change of season goes unnoticed and the pleasures of every season fail to touch the people of the land. Isabella Valency Crawford Isabella Valency Crawford was born in Dublin, Ireland and migrated to Canada in her infancy. From a very early age, she started writing poems and stories in newspapers to earn her living. She has remained a significant figure in Canadian literature for being one of the earliest women writers of Canada. Her most famous work is a long narrative poem, Malcolm's Katie, A Love Story, 1884. Old Spooks's Pass, in which Gisley, the Shifton, appears was published in 1894. Malcolm's Katie. Malcolm's Katie is a series of interrelated love stories. In addition to the story of the love between Max and Katie, there is the story of love between Katie and her father Malcolm, the love of Alfred for Malcolm's gold and the patriotic love of Max for his nation. All these love stories culminate in the triumph of love and the creation of a new Edenic society. On all these levels there is conflict and the ultimate triumph of love. North of Rye has described Isabella Valency Crawford's poems as mythopic. In this poem, along with myths, there is a significant anthropomorphization of nature. Sun, moon, north wind, south wind, Indian culture, white culture, all are symbols of nature as well as binary opposites. The poem consists of songs in the tradition of drama. This serves the dramatic function of reflecting personal stakes and commenting on particular situations from outside as in oral songs. Gisli the Shifton Gisli the Shifton presents the complete annual cycle of Gisli, whose name in Icelandic means sunbeam. Crawford rejoins figure from separate mythologies combining the Russian goddesses Lara, goddess of love and fertility, and the Icelandic god Udin and Brynhild. The main characters in these narrative poems are Lara, Gisli, and his rival Brynhild, who is caught between the two. In this poem, Gisli carries a spear which represents the exuberance of life, of cosmic and biological energies. The entire part 1 celebrates Gisli's spear and his rivalry with Brian Hild. 
Gizli is related to all other active masculine symbols such as the eagle that kills the dove and the west wind that blows away the mists. In part 1, Gizli himself is the chief agent, in part 2 the west wind and in part 2 the eagle. Through this particular discussion on confederation poetry, what we have tried to analyze is the various aspects of reading the Canadian landscape and the nature by the poets. The nature as a force, as an indomitable force, closely aligned with the force of human civilization, we have encountered a narrative that gradually developed through the poems. A narrative which are interconnected, a narrative that talks about the settler people's idea of the new adopted land.